The human experience is comprised of so many obstacles that come in an endless variety, which is balanced out by the triumphs and victories that perseverance and hope can bring. These trials and the hardships they bring paired with things like love and empathy for our neighbors is what makes us human. Our ability to understand what someone is going through, as well as our ability to keep moving forward even when our shoes feel like they've been filled with concrete, are the things that make scaling those impossible walls possible. Pain, regret, anger, fear, envy, these things can drag us down if we're not careful, and for the most part, we all pretty easily combat them on a daily basis even if we don't notice it. But something that is much tougher to fight and come out on the other side alright, is despair. If there's one thing I'd say is among the strongest of motivations among humans, it would be hope. Hope that we can overcome what's in our way, hope that better days are coming, hope that someone can save us, hope that there's more out there waiting for us than our own sadness. Hope is incredibly powerful and more than enough to push someone beyond their limitations even when all they want to do is quit. But what do we do when piece by piece our hope is taken from us and before we know it, there's nothing left? What do we do when the universe drops the final straw on the camel's back and we're sent hurtling into despair? Devilman Crybaby takes some time to toy with these questions while leaving enough for us to chew on for ourselves. I will be talking spoilers in this video, so if you want to check out Devilman Crybaby, go for it. It's only 10 episodes long and it is a Netflix original. Before we dive in, however, make sure you hit the like and subscribe since there's more content on the way. Don't forget to hit the bell icon so you never miss out on uploads. You can stay in the loop on what I'm planning to work on via the Somewhere Past Never Discord server, or if you want to show some extra support, you can hop on over to the Patreon page. Links to both will be in the description below. With that out of the way, let's get to it. Now, before we can really dive in, I do need to give you a brief summary of the plot of Devilman Crybaby. The story follows Akira Fudo, a weak and wimpy high school student who's also known for being a crybaby. However, he's a crybaby in the sense that he cries on behalf of others when something happens to them. So right off the bat, we know he's empathetic. Akira's childhood friend Ryo shows up out of the blue one day to enlist Akira's help in revealing to the world the existence of demons. To do so, he takes Akira to an underground drug and sex fueled party known as Sabbath. Nothing really happens at first, but Ryo notes that something important is missing from this den of vices, which happens to be violence since demons are attracted to blood. Ryo starts assaulting partygoers and that does set off a chain reaction in which demons begin to possess humans and some rather grotesque body horror type transformations. However, things get out of hand and Ryo is attacked. In an attempt to save Ryo, Akira is also set upon by demons but ends up getting possessed himself. Even though he gets possessed, Akira retains his human heart and uses his newfound powers as Devilman to save the remaining humans at the party. But not only does his possession make him stronger, it also changes his physical appearance and his attitude to a degree. That's the basic gist of the plot, Ryo wants to use Akira to help root out and destroy demons. At first. But that's a different story. It's also important to make note of who our important characters are for this discussion, aside from Akira and Ryo. First, there's Miki, another of Akira's childhood friends and fellow track teammate. Akira lives with her and her family, consisting of her parents, whose names I can't be bothered to look up, and her little brother Taro. Akira's own parents are incredibly talented doctors who travel the world helping people, so he quite literally never sees them. So Miki's family is basically a stand-in for them, with he and Miki having an extremely close relationship. Miki is also the star of the track team. Next, there's Miko, a friend of Miki and Akira who also runs track. While definitely a friend, she harbors some resentment towards Miki for constantly outshining her to the point people stopped calling her by her real name, which also happens to be Miki. Then there's this group of guys whose names I also can't be bothered to look up that have rap breaks in several episodes, with their raps summarizing the state of the plot and the world from the perspective of the civilian in said world. They have several run-ins with Akira and Miki who they eventually befriend towards the end of the series. With our players in place, we can start to discuss the things that truly make this anime shine. By no means is this an incredible show. You might be surprised to know that I wouldn't even put this in my top 20, but it's the thematic execution that I think deserves praise. For the most part, we can basically skip the entire first half of the show with the exception of episode 4. This episode contains the first major blow to Akira while also giving us a glimpse at the kinds of things to come. Akira's mother is due to arrive for a visit in Japan for the first time in a while, and though she wasn't planning to stay long, she naturally wanted to see her son. This is the episode in which we learn just how little contact Akira has had with his parents, but despite that lack of contact, he still very much loves his parents, and they love him. There's a point when Akira mentions to Ryo that when he was in junior high, he'd only heard his mother's voice a total of two times. Unfortunately, before he gets a chance to reunite with his parents, his father turns into a demon and slaughters everyone on an airport bus, which includes Akira's mother. The victims were then assimilated into the flesh of the devil his father transformed into, in the form of death masks. When Akira arrives on the scene, it's too late to save his mother or anyone else for that matter, and what's left of his mother apologizes to him for being an absentee parent before telling him that she is already dead. 
and then falls to Akira to put his mother and the other victims out of their misery by killing what became of his father. In one fell swoop, Akira lost both of his parents after going so long without having seen either of them. Worse, due to the circumstances of their deaths, there was no way for him to talk to anyone about what happened with the exception of Ryo. However, Ryo is a very detached and calculated individual to the point of callousness with everyone except Akira, so the death of Akira's parents basically means nothing to Ryo. Hence, Akira couldn't do anything but just keep those feelings and regrets to himself. There's a setup for a pretty important thread in episode 6 when before a big track meet that has Relay Race Miki and Akira are competing in, the two have this exchange. Right away, this really hammers home just how much Miki believes in and trusts Akira. Even someone with subpar intuition would be able to pick up on the fact that this is going to come back around in an important way later, and it very much does. The big track meet in question is also the pivot point in the series when Ryo sets his plan in motion to reveal the existence of demons to the world. One of the competitors, a character named Koda, is a devil man like Akira, and at this point, so is Miko. Ryo knows Koda's secret and intends to have Akira assist him in revealing that to the world since the track meet was going to be broadcast live. The plan is to have Akira trick Koda into ingesting an experimental liquid mixed into a sports drink that would force his demon side to emerge when paired with graphic imagery. However, Akira being the empath he is, can see that Koda has his own sadness buried just beneath the surface and so he refrains from tricking the track star. Instead, during the race, Akira tries to connect with Koda who seems receptive to the idea that he's not alone in his struggles, but unbeknownst to Akira who didn't give Koda the tainted sports drink, Ryo had successfully done so just before the race began. Using violent and pornographic imagery to trigger the primal nature of the demon inside Koda, Ryo watches gleefully as Koda loses control and goes on a rampage exactly as intended, resulting in the deaths of dozens of bystanders. In the aftermath of this event, society as a whole becomes paranoid and untrusting of one another. Streets and shops are virtually empty aside from armored vehicles and mobs of people carrying weapons with the intent of lynching suspected devils. Tons of humans are dying as a result of Ryo's actions with the fear that someone might be a demon overriding the rationale of the increasingly fearful human population. People have allowed their fear to take root which leads to suspicion, which leads to doubt, which leads to violence which only serves to birth more demons. Hell, things have gotten so bad so quickly that plenty of people have taken to fleeing themselves off of buildings in order to escape the ever encroaching despair. Things get even worse for Akira and his family when Miki's mother takes Taro and leaves the family behind. See, as I mentioned earlier, a big part of summoning demons or becoming one is exposure to both violence and unrestrained sexual deviancy. And over the course of this season, we've seen glimpses of Taro sneaking onto the family computer and exposing himself to sexual content or watching the news and being exposed to acts of violence. You can even see that after Ryo's broadcast sends society into a panicked tailspin that Taro's appearance changes. Before long, we see him fighting back a hunger building inside of him which leads him to stealing and consuming someone's dog while he's out running errands with his mom. Seeing what their son is becoming and knowing that he'd be taken away and or executed if authorities found out or that the family could be lynched if the mobs found out, Miki's mother elects to instead run away with Taro. She sends the family a goodbye text which puts Akira and Miki's father on the hunt for them. Miki's father is the first to find his wife and son and much to his horror, Taro has already transformed into a demon and has begun consuming his mother. Once he realizes what has befallen his family, the man falls into unmitigated despair. He tries to bring himself to fire at his former son but struggles with the act of doing so. He shouts and sobs and just otherwise breaks down while trying to build up the resolve to put his transformed child out of his misery. Think about how this must have felt for him. He received a text from his wife saying she was taking Taro and leaving, which would instantly put any man into a state of panic. He wanders out into an increasingly paranoid and dangerous world to bring them back home, risking his own life in the process. Suddenly, there's a lucky break and Akira tips him off to where his family is and when he arrives, he calls his son's phone and moves towards the sound of the ringtone. In that moment, there must have been an unparalleled sense of relief. He must have been able to breathe easier in that refugee camp, figuring his family was safe and sound inside their tent. While I didn't touch on it, an important part of this man's character is that he's both anti-violence and very much religious. He can even be seen earlier reading his bible to Taro and before he leaves to find his family, he isn't afraid of getting hurt because he says God will protect him. So imagine what he must have felt in the deepest reaches of his heart when he discovers a dead wife and a demon-possessed son eating her. What had his faith gotten him? Why had God protected him but not his family? Everything he loved and believed in was ripped away instantly. In the end, he ends up being gunned down by the police when he refuses to stand aside so they can kill Taro. He instinctively defends Taro, still claiming him as his son, and so the police kill them both without a second thought. 
Akira arrives too late and recovers all three bodies, taking them off to bury them somewhere. By this point, with the exception of Miki, Akira has lost his entire family, both his blood family and those that took him in. He wasn't able to tell Miki about the fate of his parents, but now he's also burdened with the responsibility of telling Miki what befell hers. Not quite done with his scheming, Ryo outs Akira as a demon on a live broadcast and then adds fuel to humanity's fire by quote unquote revealing that the real enemy is humanity itself since anyone dissatisfied with life or society in general is at risk of becoming a demon. So by proxy, the only way for humanity to survive is to eradicate every human that feels this way before they can turn into a demon. By this point, humanity is in such a tailspin that it's easy for them to just eat this up and believe it without questioning it. The police come for Akira, and when he goes to leave, he reassures Miki that he'll come back to her, to which she says, <laughs> Which is a quick nod back to their chat on the roof, and the fact that despite being a weak crybaby most of his life, Akira has always been there to defend Miki. Akira comes across a large group of men and women who have been tied to poles and are being stoned by an angry mob who swear they're devils, despite the obvious contradiction that if any of them were demons, they would have easily broken free and killed everyone. Try to imagine for a second that you're one of the captives bound to one of those poles. Imagine the pain of being hammered with rocks, pipes, taking gunfire, and other brutalities being levied against you. Imagine the sinking feeling, the looming dread and sheer hopelessness of being slowly and violently executed because people that were once your neighbors or friends let their fear outweigh their rationality. Even though none of these people get any speaking lines, imagine the intense despair that must have been consuming them being fully aware that no matter what they said or how they tried to defend themselves, they'd just be ignored and killed anyway. Like I said before, Akira isn't someone who cries for himself when he's sad. He cries for others when they go through loss or hardship and are too stubborn or closed off to cry for themselves. So seeing the men and women being stoned by a cackling and gleeful crowd of fellow but bloodthirsty humans draws out more tears on behalf of the human population that is very quickly self-destructing. On the other side of town, an angry mob shows up to Miki's house believing she's also a devil, people from Miki's own neighborhood that know her and her family. They cut the power and lay siege to the place. As Miki and Miko make their escape with the help of Miko's demon form, the two reconcile the tension that had grown between them and re-stabilize their friendship only for Miko to be gunned down by their pursuers, but ends up taking her own life before they can have the satisfaction of killing her themselves. While Miki makes a run for it, a bullet grazes her leg, dramatically slowing her pace before a car pulls up in front of her. For a moment, there's relief as she sees one of the guys that tried to protect her during the siege on her house in the front seat. That relief is immediately ripped away from her when he falls out of the car dead, sending her into a newly rekindled panic. The entire time she's running, she's envisioning passing a baton to Akira like they'd talked about. In her heart of hearts, she believes Akira is going to make it back just like he always does and protect her from harm. However, that's not how it plays out, and Miki is brutally murdered, just like her friends were. When Akira finally makes it back, he finds Miki's house completely ablaze with a mob of people dancing happily with the heads and limbs of his friends, including Miki, on spikes like savages. This time, despair aims right for Akira and he finally sheds tears for himself. Everyone he knew and loved was gone now, the worst of which being Miki, who was his everything. Miki's existence was what allowed him to remain himself after fusing with a demon during the Sabbath party. Without her, he'd have just become another heartless killing machine. To add insult to injury, the only one left alive that was connected to Akira in any meaningful way was also the one responsible for taking everything from him. The final gut punch of the show comes in the way of the anime's conclusion. With the world being torn apart by infighting between humans and the demons under orders to eradicate humans from Ryo who turns out to be Satan, the end of the world is basically well underway. Devilmen from all across the planet have joined Akira in one final push to overcome Ryo and save what little is left of the human population. Akira puts up a good fight, but it's Ryo who lands the decisive blow and the two end up laying under the stars together on some debris jutting up out of the ocean. Ryo goes on a monologue about love and sadness and seems very pleased with himself, only to realize that he's the only one participating in the conversation. That's when it's revealed to the audience that Ryo's last attack vaporized the entire bottom portion of Akira's body, and that despite the framing of the scene, Akira has been dead the entire time. The cold, methodical, and otherwise emotionless Ryo suddenly, for the first time, understands the concept and feeling of despair that humans battle on a daily basis. Specifically, the despair that comes with confronting the debilitating pain that death leaves behind. Throughout nearly the entirety of his human life, Ryo has had Akira by his side to some degree. He was Ryo's only true friend and he was the person Ryo wanted to continue having by his side even in the new world he was attempting to create. But now that wasn't possible and Akira was never coming back. 
Even with all the power afforded to Ryo as Satan, it must have felt unbelievably human to be unable to do anything but sob in the face of the immovable permanence of death. Ryo finally understood the pain Akira felt when he cradled Miki's severed head, that the one person he couldn't live without was somewhere far beyond his reach forever. If I had to summarize this anime in one sentence, it would be the old phrase, no good deed goes unpunished. While the show can be amusing with how laughably bad the artwork is at times, or just how often it really likes to show you some titties, by the halfway mark, you kind of stop noticing these things. The show seems to take a kind of pride in turning anime tropes on their head to circumvent your expectation and leave you feeling noticeably worse than when you started. Unlike most anime these days, there's no light at the end of this tunnel. It's just you, your thoughts, and the bleakness of humanity collapsing under the weight of fear spreading like a wildfire. The love interest doesn't make it out alive, children aren't spared from the horror, everyone that even remotely tries to do a good thing is brutally murdered, and the hero doesn't beat the bad guy. In the end, we'll forget about the art that looks like it was drawn by Michael J. Fox, or the terrible English, or the sometimes hype soundtrack. Just as with classics like Neon Genesis and The Wolf's Reign, what will stick with us when we lay down to sleep long into the future is the unyielding despair of Devilman Crybaby. Thanks for watching everyone. March has been a very busy month for me, so I'm honestly not sure if this went up on time or not. I guess Editor Saturn will know though. There's going to be a bit of time between this video and the next one on the list because I'm finally going to be doing a video on Yu Yu Hakusho's Three Kings arc. I've been putting it off because I didn't really want to do it, but I figured it'd be a nice bookend to my Yu Yu stuff until the Netflix adaptation airs. Let me just go ahead and say this isn't going to be a video essay like the ones you're used to with the Dark Tournament and Chapter Black. I have something else in mind and I hope you guys end up enjoying it. That'll probably take a while to work on, so there might not be a video for April, but I'll see what I can do. Don't forget that you can join the Discord server to stay up to date on scheduled projects, and just hang out. Big shout out to Zorin and AJA for the continued support on Patreon, and if you'd like to show some support, feel free to hop on over to the Somewhere Past Never Patreon page, where for as little as $1 a month, you can gain access to videos a few days before they go live on YouTube, as well as get priority suggestions for videos that I can add to the schedule. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and comment to help the algorithm push my content to more viewers, especially with us coming up on 2,000 subscribers soon. Take care of yourselves and others, and as always, thanks for watching.